Okay, so I said that we weren't going to talk about the recover function, but I heard people out there in my head, students in the class saying, oh, I want to know about recover. So I figured I'd do that and just talk about recover a little bit. I'm not 100% today. I apologize for that. All right, so recover. The best place to learn about recover is this article, the Go blog, Defer Panic and Recover, August 10th. Uh, August 2010, August 4th, 2010. Go has the usual mechanisms for control flow, if, for, switch, and surprisingly, go to, which we haven't talked to about haven't talked about at all, takes me back to junior high and basic programming. It also has the go statement to run code in a separate go routine. Here I'd like to discuss some of the less common ones, defer, panic, and recover. Notice how this is all control flow, right? Controlling the flow of code. With if and switch, we have conditional. With for, we have iterative. Control, control flow is sequential. Or we could also go concurrent and concurrent, right? Many go routines, concurrent code. And then defer, panic, and recover. Defer, deferring a function, defer, deferring something to run. That's also considered control flow, as is panic and recover. So that's pretty awesome. And this is written by somebody who uh, knows what they're doing with Go, uh, Andrew Gerond, Gerond. Pretty awesome. He's one of the guys on the Go team. A defer statement pushes a function call onto a list. Later, try tonight. Uh, this, the list of saved calls is executed after the surrounding function returns. Defer is commonly used to simplify functions that perform various cleanup actions. For example, let's look at a function that opens two files and copies the contents of one file to another. So open the file, OS open, OS create, create a file, and then copy from that source, the reader, to the destination, the writer and then close those two files and return. This works, but there's a bug. The, if the call to OS create fails, right, the function will return without closing the source file. Uh, and the source file is this one up here. This can be easily remedied by putting a call to source close before the second return statement, so somewhere right in there. But if the function were more complex, the problem might not be so easily noticed and resolved. By introducing defer statements, we can ensure that the files are always closed. So open it, and defer close. Create it, and defer close. And then just copy, right? Copy one to the other. And notice how the return values bytes written and error, if any. That's pretty sweet. Defer statements allow us to think about closing each file right after opening it, guaranteeing that regardless of the number of return statements in the function, the files will be closed. So that's, that's an awesome statement. The behavior of defer statements is straightforward and predictable, so we're going to learn a little bit more about defer here. Three simple rules. A deferred function's arguments are evaluated when the defer statement is evaluated. So right here, right, this is a, in this example, expression i is evaluated when print line call is deferred. Uh, the deferred call will print zero after the function returns. That's pretty cool. So this is when the defer statement is evaluated. At that point, i is zero. When this actually runs, it's going to print out zero because that's when the i was evaluated. Deferred function calls are executed last in, first out order after the surrounding function returns. So loop from zero to three and defer 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3, and then last in, first out, last in was 3, that's first out, so we get 3, 2, 1, 0. <laughs> so last in, first out order. And defer functions may read and assign to the returning functions named return values. So this is a bit of a wacky example, and I expanded on it for us and put the code into our course outline right there. But when you expand on that, you can see here, and let me just get rid of this. Well, I guess that's instructive too. But here we do var x int. That means x is zero. We add one to it. We print it. We get one. And then we call c. c is returning a named return. We haven't done named returns in this course because I think they're poopy. <laughs> I don't think they're best practice. But uh, here it's a named return. And so this could be anything here. I'll do it y, right, just so we're clear. And we're going to defer func, and it's an anonymous self-executing func or a func literal. Call it what you will. We're deferring that. We're returning one. Then this runs, right? And uh, strangely enough, since it's the return, it'll take one and add one to it, which gives us two. Kind of a wacky example for illustrating the concept. Deferred functions may read and assign to the returning functions named return values. In this example, a deferred function increments the return value i after... That's huge. 
the surrounding function returns, thus the function returns too. This is convenient for modifying the error return value of a function. We'll see an example of this shortly. Panic is a built-in function that stops, and we just learned about panic. Panic is a built-in function that stops ordinary flow of control and begins panicking. When the function f calls panic, execution of f stops. Any deferred functions in f are executed normally, and then f returns to its caller. To the caller, f then behaves like a call to panic. The process continues up the stack until all functions in the current Go routine have returned, at which point the program crashes, ends. Uh, <clears throat> panic can be initiated by invoking panic directly. They can also be caused by runtime errors such as out-of-bounds array accesses. Recover is a built-in function that gains re control, regains control of panicking Go routine. So notice this, built-in. So if we went to built-in, we would see recover. Package built-in, recover. So recover is a built-in function that regains control of a panicking Go routine. Recover is only useful inside deferred functions. That's huge. During normal execution, a call to recover will return nil and have no other effect. If the current Go routine is panicking, a call to recover will capture the value given to panic and resume normal execution. During normal execution, a call to recover will return nil and have no other effect. So, you know, if you call recover and it's not in panic, nil is returned. If the current Go routine is panicking, a call to recover will capture the value given to panic and resume normal execution. Here's an example of a program that demonstrates the mechanics of panic and defer. And I have this one right here for us. I'm going to format this and run it. And here's the output that we get. Call in G, printing in G, panicking, deferred, recovered, return normally from F. So F is called. And then we defer this function. And this is a anonymous self-executing function. And if uh, and here we have two statements on one line separated by a semicolon. So this is a, a common idiom in Go. So recover, call recover, we get R. If R is not nil, that means we're panicking, right? And this all has to be inside of a defer function for recover to work. And, uh, and then we could print recover to F, and we could print out R, whatever that value is that came from recover. And then, so we defer that. That's deferred. We print line calling G. That's the first one. We call G, and we pass in 0. If I is greater than 3, we're going to panic. Okay, panicking, and we're going to print call panic and pass in a value there, pass in whatever the value of i is as a string. And then we're going to defer print line, defer in g what number we are in g. And then we're going to print line printing in g, 3, uh, right there, i. And then we're going to call g again and do i plus 1, right? And so we're passing in 0. So the first time printing in g, printing in g, 0. And then this calls again, printing in g, 1. And these are deferred, printing in G2, printing in G3. These are all deferred. And then we hit here 4, and we panic. So panicking prints out. And then we pass 4 into this as a string. So panic runs. We go up the call stack, uh, executing any defer statements first. So those go in last in, first out order, 3, 2, 1, 0. And then up here, when we get up here, right, this has been deferred. And since we're recovering, we're going to recover our panic. And so, hey, here's recover. It's, it's uh, not equal to nil. We're actually in a panic. That's running. And, uh, and then right here, we print out format print line um, recovered in F4, right? And then that is done. And we returned normally from G, return normally from G. And so we come back here and return normally from F return normally from F. So we never get down to return normally from G, right? Uh, it just runs the, the defer. So that's an interesting thing to note. Recovered in F4 and return normally from F is right up here. Sweet. So that's kind of a complex example, and it's a little bit more definitely of that intermediate to advanced code, but I thought it might be useful for some people just to have a little bit of a, a walkthrough on, um, on Recover, just so you're aware of it, and you got a little bit of exposure to it, so that when you do come across it, it's not quite so foreign, but it is an intermediate to advanced um, uh, skill technique and, uh, and unique situations where you would use it. All right, uh, for examples of it, uh, you could see here, for the real-world example of panic and recover, you could see the JSON package. 
And uh, and you could also, and then he talks about real world examples of defer. But the JSON package has a real world example of panic and recover. That's a little bit about recover. 